A new conservation initiative is underway on an island in Georgian Bay. It's being conducted by Shawanaga First Nation and could serve as a model for additional Indigenous-led stewardship projects in the province. Charnel Anderson covers the Northwest for Ontario Hubs and she joins us now from Red Rock on the north shore of Lake Superior for more. Hello, Charnel. Hi, Jan. All right, so last time you were here, we talked about how Indigenous knowledge can inform approaches to climate change. I'm hoping you can recap for us what that exactly means. Yeah, so last time I think I mentioned that there's no universally accepted definition of Indigenous knowledge or Indigenous knowledge system. And that's still true. Um, but what I've come to learn, you know, is that Indigenous knowledge is really embedded in the culture um, in the language, traditions, even the location where people are living. Um, you know, it's really intrinsic to this relationship with the land. And I think that's why Indigenous knowledge lends itself so well to climate change initiatives. Um, a recent study from the University of British Columbia looked at vertebrate biodiversity on Indigenous managed lands. Um, so it looked at, you know, birds, reptiles, mammals, uh, things with <laughs> spines. Um, and that study found that indigenous managed lands are better at supporting vertebrate biodiversity compared to state-led protected areas. And the article didn't say much about why that's the case, um, but it did cite other research that found that, quote, uh, curtailing indigenous management involving fire, forestry, fishing, or hunting practices can cause declines in species, diversity, and ecosystem productivity, end quote. So um, I think it's clear that Indigenous knowledge and land management practices uh, help to support biodiversity, and, you know, that in turn may help in the fight against climate change. So let's talk about maybe closer to our home here. How is that being applied when we talk about Indigenous knowledge to conservation to protect biodiversity here? Yeah, so that's kind of the question that I was hoping to answer um, as I went about reporting, you know, how is Indigenous knowledge being used? Is it being used? Is this something that the government supports? And it turns out the answer is yes. Um, so a few years ago, the federal government began funding um, Indigenous-led conservation, um, also called Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas, or IPCAs for short. And so I reported on Shawanaga First Nation, which is near Perry Sound, and they're developing an IPCA on Shawanaga Island, which is, as you mentioned, in Georgian Bay. And it's a culturally important spot to the community. Um, there's lots of old growth white, white pine stands that uh, survived kind of the logging mania the last few centuries. Um, there's culturally significant foods like cranberries and wild rice that grow out there. And so in talking to Shawanaga's IPCA coordinator, Chris Birch, um, he told me that, you know, besides protecting and conserving this area, they really want it uh, to be a place where people can go to reconnect with the land. And so uh, they've received funding for this project and they're working on the management, uh, the management plan currently to kind of sort out all the details of their IPCA. I actually want to uh, pull up a photo. You, you sort of describe sort of that beautiful scenery there and I want to make sure our viewers see it. So uh, tell us exactly where this sort of photo was taken and what we're sort of overlooking. I imagine is this, would this be sort of Georgian Bay? Right, exactly. Yeah. So this is Shawanaga Island and I mean, you can see how beautiful it is, right? Like, of course you want to protect that. Now, one of the things that you had talked about in terms of sort of this process is that this is a long-term project. This isn't something that is going to happen in a couple, in, in a year or two. This is a long-term uh, sort of project. How long um, is sort of this uh, sort of commitment from the federal government uh, with sort of uh, Indigenous-led knowledge in terms of protecting uh, this area? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, um, actually, we can kind of trace the history of this initiative back to uh, 2018, which is when the federal government announced the Target One Challenge. Um, and so that's one of, I believe, 19 um, biodiversity goals set by the federal government. And um, the original goal for the Target One Challenge was to protect 17 percent of land and inland water by 2020. And that has since expanded to 25 percent of land and water by 2025 and 30% by 2030. And so um, as part of that goal, uh, a group of experts um, were assembled to create ICE, the Indigenous Circle of Experts. And um, they did some work together and they put together a report called We Rise Together, which explains what IPCs, IPCAs are because they do come in different shapes and sizes depending on you know who's managing them, where they're managing, but <clears throat> they all have three things in common um, according to ICE. So they're Indigenous led, um, they represent a long-term commitment to conservation, and they elevate Indigenous rights and responsibilities. 
Um, and so that report also goes on to uh, include recommendations for how the government can support IPCAs. So in 2018, um, Canada began funding IPCAs, and so far, uh, 27 communities have received funding to establish IPCAs, and 25 other communities have received funding for preliminary work to kind of um, talk to the community and you know maybe map out the boundaries. Um, so that work may ultimately. Um, end up in an IPCA. Now, when we're talking about protecting biodiversity in this area, I think we should definitely show some photos of some of those initiatives. Tell us what we're looking at here with this cute Yeah. Guy. <laughs> so this guy is a Blanding's turtle, and you can tell by his chin and his throat, the bright yellow. And so those guys are found in uh, central and eastern Canada, as well as, of course, Shawanaga. And they're considered a threatened species, and that's because of habitat loss. Um, so in 2008, they were added to the species at risk list. And then these little guys, um, there's kind of a neat story behind these. The community already has a species at risk program in place to support blanding turtles and these other species. Um, so for example, uh, this summer, the species at risk team collected turtle eggs that were near um, where road construction would be taking place. So they collected the eggs, and then they incubated them, and they invited um, the community to come later in the summer to release the turtles back into the wetlands. Um, so that's an example of something that's already in place, but Shawanaga wants to have um, additional protection measures as well in their um, IPCA management plan when that comes to fruition. I actually want to pull up another photo, and I'm hoping you can sort of tell us what this depicts about the way conservation has left the Indigenous experience out of the conversation. Yeah, so uh, this photo, it looks like a mother and daughter there in uh, Quetico Provincial Park, um, and they're canoeing and looking at a pictograph on a rock face. Um, and so, I mean, there's lots of pict pictographs in the area because um, Anishinaabe people lived there prior to colonization and created the pictograph. <laughs> um, but uh, in 1909, the province made this area, it's over one million hectare area in northwestern Ontario, um, into a forest reserve, and that has since become a, a provincial park, Quetico Provincial Park. And so not long after the government created the park, um, the indigenous people that lived there and kind of, you know, had taken care of the land for thousands of years were kicked out of the area. So to me, that photo is kind of like a stark representation of the history of conservation in Canada, which, you know, oftentimes involves removing indigenous people from the land uh, for non-indigenous people to you know, uh, come in and use it as recreation. We have a, about a minute left, but I do want to ask you, you know, the Indigenous circle of, of experts, uh, talk about how, you know, the effects of previous Canadian governments to create sort of parks and protected areas wasn't really centered on necessarily the health and well-being of nature. And I, I'm curious, you know, you kind of outlined sort of one of the key things in this is being uh, Indigenous-led. How does this initiative sort of help towards reconciliation? Right. I think, um, you know, well, there's one source that I talked to, Rachel Plotkin, um, from the David Suzuki Foundation, who said, you know, in addition to the obvious benefits around conservation and protection and biodiversity, um, IPCs are beneficial in that they return governance to Indigenous people, which in turn allows them to honor their legal rights and sense of responsibility to the land. Um, and Rachel also pointed out that, you know, this is in line with the land back movement. Um, IPCAs, you know, can potentially give Indigenous people control over land taken away during the process of colonization. So I think in that sense, you know, there is some potential for this um, to have benefits for reconciliation. A really great story. Thank you so much, Charnel. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jan. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.